been at it 40 years yeah. and I'm still finding parts that need to be healed, but it's natural. Ask these questions of that place in your body and wait for the answers to come. Do you have something you want to explore? Um... My guest today is a psychotherapist who created a very interesting and effective therapeutic modality called Internal Family Systems, or IFS. It's quite a radical shift in paradigm. You left all that in the past, not realizing you were locking away, exiling your most precious qualities. Dr. Richard Schwartz. Dick Schwartz. Dick Schwartz. IFS. Yeah, it's incredible. Dick Schwartz is stuff. Maybe some of these parts are bad, can we not label that as something pernicious that we need to, you know, override and, and, and overcome? You can, but it hasn't been working that well. He has authored several books on the subject, including You Are the One You've Been Waiting For. This conversation explores Dr. Schwartz's many parts, multiplicity of mind model. This is a real inner family that we, we all live with. It's like your external family if you neglect them. We discuss how IFS operates to address various conditions, addiction, trauma, depression, and intimacy. This exchange has really stuck with me. I find myself thinking about myself, my parts, and why I do what I do a little bit differently, quite differently, as a matter of fact, as a result of this conversation. And I suspect after listening, you may as well. So without further ado, this is me and Dr. Richard Schwartz. Thank you so much for coming here today. I've been looking forward to this for a very long time. And as I mentioned to, to you just prior to recording, um, I followed your work for some time. Uh, you've appeared on a number of podcasts that I listen to regularly. So I'm familiar with your work, but what really um, locked in an interest in, 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 in getting you on the show uh, was uh, a lunch that I had with with my friend Rangan Chatterjee. I was in London okay. last year and mm -hmm. we met up and had a meal and he just couldn't stop talking about <laughs> IFS and his experience with you. And he's like, you gotta listen to the podcast that I did with Richard. And he was raving about how beneficial um, your work, your methodology has been in his own life. And, uh, and uh, and so that that was really kind of like you know stayed with me. And then you know when I, I don't know who reached out, but when you were making yourself available, I um, mm -hmm. was very glad to, to you know have the experience to talk to you today. So thank you. Well, it's very mutual. I'm, I'm a fan, and I like I told you, I I love what you're doing for the culture, and just happy to support it. And and uh, yeah, I had a real a good time with him. Yeah, yeah, he's a good dude. Indeed. Yeah, so um, why don't we you know, start off with the obvious question, which is what is internal family systems, IFS? Set the stage and, and, and explain your perspective um, on your particular modality of treating people. Okay, uh, what it is, it, it began as a form of psychotherapy and it's kind of expanded to being more like a life practice, or a way of understanding human beings that's a bit of a different paradigm. And uh, yeah, the basic assumption is none of us are unitary personalities. That It's the nature of the mind to have lots of different, what I call parts, but other people call other names, ego states, things like that, subpersonalities, mm -hmm. that it's natural. And that those parts uh, are all valuable. So I wrote a book, No Bad Parts. I've, I've been doing this 40 years mm -hmm. and I've done it with people who've done heinous things. And even those parts, if you listen to their secret history, will reveal how they're just stuck in a place in the past and they're trying to best to protect the person and they carry this energy of their perpetrator and so on. So in that sense, it's quite a radical shift in paradigm. Right, given that the conventional, traditional uh, psychological paradigm is one of mono mind, as opposed to this multiplicity of minds that mm -hmm. is kind of the the pathway into understanding your perspective. Yeah, and, and uh, when I started talking about multiplicity, the big paradigm was from what's now called the DID uh, literature, which would be multiple personality disorder originally, mm -hmm. and 
they would acknowledge the existence of these what they called altars, but it was thought that they were fragments of the broken vase, that you were initially unitary and then trauma produced all these fragmented personalities that took on a life of their own. And uh, so I've been fighting that paradigm for a long time too, because mm -hmm. for me, they pre-existed the trauma and then they got into extreme roles because of the trauma. Sometimes just because they were trying their best to keep you safe when you were young, when it happened. Uh, but um, they, they exist, they're, they're real. It's not the, the product of the trauma. So in other words, there, are, there is this, I guess for lack of a better word, immutable, there's an immutable self. Mm -hmm. And ancillary to that immutable self are all of these parts that are swimming around and they're, they're in relationship with each other. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're performing various roles depending upon things that happen to you, et cetera. Um, and and, and, and your, your way of kind of approaching this and trying to understand it is premised on, on a systems approach, mm -hmm. like trying to understand it like a technology mm -hmm. or like, code, right? Mm -hmm. So walk me through that aspect of it. And then I kind of want to understand how you even arrived at this okay. idea to begin with. Yeah, so uh, I had a couple of big advantages coming into it. One is I have a PhD in family therapy and I was one of these obnoxious family therapists that thought we'd discovered the Holy Grail and people were mucking around in the inner world, were wasting their time because we could change all that by just reorganizing these family systems. Explain. Um, sorry, it, 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 sorry to step on you, but like explain bit. family. Like, what does that mean when you say family systems? Family, family systems therapy mm -hmm. is. Um, so, if you're working with the acting out kid, for example, you assume that that kid isn't just whatever diagnosis he carries, but that in some ways he's serving a function in the family of distracting, or he's trying to protect himself from something that's happening in the family, mm -hmm. and that. Our assumption was we could reorganize the family and try to improve whatever relationships were producing his symptoms and that he would stop doing that. And a lot of times that, that worked. But as this family therapist, I was determined to prove that. I was in a department of psychiatry and decided to do an outcome study with eating disorders because my hero at the time was a guy named Salvador Mnuchin who would used his structural family therapy with anorexia mm -hmm. and claimed a lot of success. So I was gonna do it with bulimia and found to my dismay that we could reorganize the families just right. And still a bunch of my kids didn't realize they'd been cured and, and they, they kept going. <laughs> <laughs> How dare they, I know. right? So this is sort of an external family systems model, right? That's right. Organize yeah. the people around the person afflicted with the condition you're trying to treat. That's right. And, and resolve uh, with, with uh, less than stellar results is what you're saying. Yeah, and then out of frustration, I began to ask these kids, why are you still doing it? And they started talking this very weird language to me at the time talking about these different parts of them and how they were doing all this stuff inside. And so, uh, you know, an example would be something happens in my life, it, it triggers this critic who's brutal and makes me feel horrible. And that brings up a part that feels young and empty and alone and worthless. And that feeling is so distressing that then this binge comes in to get me away from it. But the, the binge triggers the critic again, who's calling me a pig on top of the other names. And that goes right to the heart of that empty, worthless young one. Mm -hmm. So the, the binge has to come back. And I was lucky, I had a couple clients who were extremely articulate about that whole thing. And at first, so I didn't know from parts, at first I thought, ooh, these kids are sicker than I thought. Maybe they have multiple personality disorder. And then I listened inside myself and oh my God, I've got them too. And I've got this critic. And I can binge on food sometimes and other things. And I have a piece of worthlessness in there. And so then I calmed down and, and got really curious and just started to ask a lot of questions about how do they relate to each other and how does it work in there? And, um, you know, I was lucky that I hadn't studied any psychoanalytic or 
psychodynamic therapies. So I did, I came with fresh eyes. Right, like a beginner's mind Beginner's approach. mind, I was yeah. just gonna say that. So I really had to trust what they were saying about the phenomena. And that's partly why this is different, I think, than mm -hmm. a lot of things. Both that and the systems frame where rather than just focusing on one part, trying to figure it out, I was really trying to understand the way this whole network operated as a system. And that's what we go to change. We're trying to change the whole network rather than just one at a time. Right. I think it is a universal condition of being human that we understand we have different voices in our head. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I, you know I, I don't think you have to be afflicted by anything particular or acute mm -hmm. to relate to the idea that sometimes you feel worthless, sometimes you feel better than somebody else, sometimes you feel judgmental or hard on yourself in a, in a way that you, you know, is disproportionate to whatever's happening or mm -hmm. you know, self-esteem, like the, the, the list is endless, right? right. So, Within that, there's this inner monologue that we all have about the relationship between the person we think we are or the person we wish we were mm -hmm. and how that relates to all of these other, you know, kind of voices that are criticizing us or urging us to do this or that, which either are in parallel or orthogonal to that, you know, sense of, of, of who we think we are or want to be. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And my contention is these aren't just little voices or thought patterns or emotions. Those are the manifestations of these parts. But if I were to have you focus on one of them exclusively for a second and get curious about it and just ask, you'd find out that it's a full range personality that really has a lot to tell you besides the little thought it's giving you mm -hmm. and that it's stuck in an extreme role often if it's an extreme part, because of something that happened in your childhood maybe, or uh, yeah, and that through trial and error over time, we found out how to help all these parts change mm -hmm. into actually leave their extreme roles and become who they're designed to be. So that's the goal of the model. It's was, the there, yeah, was there like a light bulb moment though, in terms of how you, started to think about the lattice work or the rela the relationship between all of these? Like how does the systems, cause it just seems so murky and, and hard to get your hands around like what is actually going on? Like how do you overlay this um, with some sense of organization or, or kind of, I don't know, um, uh, you know, animating kind of unifying principle? You know, it's really interesting because as we talk about it, it seems murky. But if I was to have you focus inside, you would start, to, oh, there is this one over here and there's this other one over here and it becomes far less murky. You can actually map it all out and we actually help people do that. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the, it's just so rare for people to do it. People do it through mindfulness and they'll notice their thoughts and emotions. But for me, it's not compassionate to watch suffering beings parade by passively. So this is mindfulness plus, it's like get mindful and then go to them and help them and hold them and mm -hmm. show them that you care about them. And they will start to relax. And you know, most, it turned out after many years of doing this that most of these parts are quite young and yet they're still running your life. It's like in family therapy, we had a concept we call parentified child. A child who was forced to be a parent because the parents had abdicated and couldn't handle it, but still tried to do it. And many of these parts are like that. They're, they're much younger. They're often, like I said, frozen in time and in bad times in your life where they got stuck. They think you're still five years old. They think they still have to protect you the way they did back then. And they carry something I'm gonna call burdens. They carry extreme beliefs and emotions that came into you in that moment and attach to these parts and drive them like a virus, mm -hmm. like the coronavirus actually. So a lot of the healing is helping them let go of these extreme beliefs and emotions, getting them out of where they're stuck in the past. I wanna dig into that in a, in a very specific way, uh, in particular, the various roles that these parts take on and why they take them on. But you mentioned mindfulness and this idea of mindfulness plus, like mindfulness, is where you're present and in a in a place of of 
awareness and noticing. So you can be aware and non-judgmental as these, you know, kind of ideas or voices are kind of passing through mm-hmm. your consciousness. Um, and depending upon the modality of, of mindfulness that you practice, or at least in certain strains of, of meditation, there's a different idea at play, which is the more Buddhist notion of, of no mind, right? Like this idea mm-hmm. that, that, you know, in a non-dualistic sense, like there is no self, there is just consciousness, right? Mm-hmm. And that is very different from what you're saying, which is there is a self. There is this self that lies within us, like this kernel, I guess, with all these orbiting, you know, uh, asteroids and planets mm-hmm. that sometimes collide into the self um, that are the respective parts. So before we get into the parts, is it is it the case from your perspective that, that 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 you know I said immutable before, like mm-hmm. we all have some self within us that is unchanging mm-hmm. since birth, mm-hmm. and is that the case for every person? And how did you arrive at that notion? Yeah, <clears throat> so and and just to clarify, what Buddhists call no self, or like you said, no mind, is what I call self. The it's semantic. Yeah, now we're getting conf- it's going to get confusing. Well, <laughs> I'll just try to explain it real quick. Uh-huh. So what you find, and and this is what I'm about to describe, is that as you get these parts to separate inside, it releases this person who, you know, when I say, what what is that that knows how to heal your parts? You would say, well, that's me, that's not these parts. So I came to call that the self for that reason. But what the Buddhists call self is really these parts. So as they open space, it's who's left which is the emptiness that's mm-hmm. so full. So it's really the same idea, really. Yeah, um, trying to understand that. I think I understand what you're saying. Um, I think we all, uh, like if we spend enough time looking at somebody who behaved badly and that person was willing to open up about why they you know, do what they do, mm-hmm. um, that you will develop an understanding, like it will make sense mm-hmm. if you understood the, the, you know, like the their life history and the mm-hmm. context in which, you know, that behavior developed over time, it would all be very black and white, right? Yeah. Like, it's it's very much in line with Gabor Mate's work, yep, I think, and I think much. you've done some stuff with him. Mm-hmm. Like, there seems to be a lot of parallels here in the sense that. Um, it's about really looking at the why behind the symptom. That's right. right. Like, why is this person doing this? Tracing it back to something that happened in in their childhood, et cetera, um, to try to make sense of it, uh, rather than let's let's just malign it or or repress it or pretend it doesn't exist and mm-hmm. focus on you know moving forward and and these other behaviors like strengthening you mm-hmm. know the more positive behaviors. Yeah, which is sort of the culture's approach to these things and a lot of therapies too. So this is quite the opposite. It's again saying they're all good. Um, They're forced into these extreme roles. But if you just take the time to start to get curious and listen to them, they'll tell you their secret histories of how they got hurt. So it isn't like I have to figure out where it happened in the past. I'm working with you and you're working with maybe your angry part, not that you have one, but and I'm it's it's in there, okay, <laughs> and I'm having you focus on it and asking it about itself, and also asking what it's afraid would happen if it didn't get so angry sometimes, mm-hmm. and answering that, you would learn that it it really is desperately trying to protect you, and that it's protecting some other part of you that's quite young and vulnerable. And we would negotiate permission to go to that one. And there's a process by which we would heal that. But all of that I would be doing when you were in what I call self. So to come back to your original question, which is how did I stumble onto that? So I was learning about these parts and I'm a family therapist. So as I took the, started taking them more seriously, um, I'm trying to get my client to relate to them differently. and. It took a while for me to get that they aren't what they seemed because at first I thought the critic was, and the field still does, some kind of internalized parental voice. Mm-hmm. The binge was some kind of out of control impulse. When you think of them that way, it makes sense to fight with a critic or, or ignore it 
or to try and control the binge. But if you think of them, as I learned ultimately, that they're just really good parts that got forced into these extreme roles and they're just trying their best to keep you safe. Then you come to them with curiosity first and ultimately compassion and you can wind up honoring them for their service like you might the military, mm -hmm. these protective parts. And they love that. And as you do that and change these internal relationships, um, they'll start to change too. And, but to get back <laughs> to the original story, so once I got hip to the fact they aren't what they seem, they deserve to be listened to, I'm trying to get my client to do that. And uh, so maybe I'm having my client talk to that critic inside and it's going pretty well, but suddenly she's furious with the critic. And it reminded me of family sessions where I'm, I'm trying to have two people, maybe a critical mother and a teenage girl talk to each other about their relationship. It's going okay. Suddenly the girl gets furious with the mother. We were taught to look around the room and see if somebody isn't subtly siding with the girl against the mother and often maybe the father is. And so mm. we were taught to get that person out of her range of vision and create a better boundary around the two of them and that she, the girl would settle down and they would have a decent conversation. And I thought, maybe the same thing's happening in this inner world. Maybe as my client's trying to get to know this critic, a part who hates the critic has come in is doing the talking. So I'd say to clients, can you find the one who's so angry at the critic and get it to just relax in there until we're done? Just ask it to give us a break here. And to my amazement, clients could do that pretty readily, most of them. Mm. And when they did it, I'd say, now how do you feel the cr toward the critic? It would be some version of, I'm just curious why it calls me names. Whereas seconds earlier, they hated it, or maybe they were terrified of it. The simple act of getting these parts to open space seemed to release this other person who not only was just curious, but also was calm and confident and even compassionate sometimes. Like, I'm, I'm sorry that it has to do this. Mm -hmm. Right, to get them, to get that self to disengage with those parts that are impulsing words and behavior mm -hmm. that are non-productive to the, the kind of healing path that you're trying to get them on. Yeah, and, and the, the big deal about IFS is that suddenly this other person that I came to call the self would emerge spontaneously. It wasn't like we had to build up the muscle of compassion or anything like that. It was really just opening space and it was uncovered, it just came out. Mm. And then in that state, the dialogue with the critic or any other part would go well, because what now this is 40 years later and thousands of people later using this, and we can pretty safely say that that self is in everybody, can't be damaged, knows how to heal, and it's just beneath the surface of these parts such that when they open space, it pops out. Hmm. The untarnished uh, self mm -hmm. that has always been there since mm -hmm. conception mm -hmm. or whenever yeah. you believe consciousness arises, uh, that then gets painted in various colors mm -hmm. by dint of the way these parts kind of emerge over time. But what I like about it is the non-pathologizing mm -hmm. kind of approach, yeah. like instead of naming these things with, uh, you know, terms and words that make us feel bad about ourselves, mm -hmm. or, you know, are in alignment with some kind of diagnosis, mm -hmm. it's understanding that all these parts are actually good faith actors, like mm -hmm. they're they're operating in what they believe to be the best interest right. of the self but they're out of, they're just out of alignment. Like exactly. they're extreme in their role or because of the interplay between, you know, different, different parts creates a, a non-optimal situation for that self to be expressed in the way that it could be otherwise. Yeah, um, like most of these parts got their roles when you were too young to protect yourself. And so they think you're not able to do that. And so they have to do it for you. And so as one of the things we do often is, is just, I would have you ask that angry one why, how old it thinks you are. Mm -hmm. And you'll get a single digit most of the time. 
And then I'll say, just update it a little bit and see how it reacts. And sometimes they're amazed that you're, you know, a grown man who can protect himself now and can take care of them. They don't have to take care of you in that same way. Yeah, they, they didn't get the uh, newsletter update. No, yeah. exactly. <laughs> they're still <laughs> operating like you're a five-year-old, right? There's, and they're still frozen yeah. in time back in that scene. Right. So, so that just, um, you know, one of the goals is to help these parts revert to their naturally valuable states. Second goal is for them to trust self as a leader, to learn they don't have to do it all because there's this other person in there that can do it for them. Mm. Yeah, I've got a lot of questions about that, but but let's get into the various roles that these parts can play. You mm-hmm. have a couple categories to help us understand that, exiles, managers, and, and firefighters. Mm-hmm. So can you walk me through? Yeah, so again, yeah. I'm a systems guy, and as I'm hearing about all this, I'm looking for distinctions and patterns. That's what systems people do. and. The big distinction that emerged immediately was between these parts that uh, were very vulnerable and hurt and then the parts that protected them. So that's really the big distinction. And as I got to know that, uh, the the first class, other systems would call inner children. So they're, they're young and sensitive, but when they're not hurt, they're playful and loving and open and creative and wonderful. And we love them. I mean, we don't really know them, but we love having them around. Mm-hmm. But they're the most sensitive parts. So they're the ones who get hurt the most by the slings and arrows or by the bad parenting or by the traumas. And once they do, they take on what I call burdens like emotional pain or worthlessness and shame or uh, terror from the event. And now they're not so much fun to be around because they have the power to overwhelm us and pull us back into those memories and make it so we can't function very well. Mm-hmm. So we kind of naturally try to lock them away in inner basements or abysses and try our best to stay away from them. And everybody around us tells us to do that because this is a rugged individualist culture. And so you probably got the message many times, just move on, don't think, don't look back, you can't change what happened. And so you did, you left all that in the past, thinking you were just moving on from the memories or the emotions, not realizing you were locking away, exiling your most precious qualities just because they got hurt. Mm -hmm. And so once you get a lot of exiles like that, you feel more delicate, the world seems more dangerous because so many things could trigger them. And again, if they get triggered, it's like flames of emotion overwhelm you and take you out. So you have this sort of unconscious fear that drives you to avoid those types of situations so that you're not back in that place. Yeah. What's interesting about that though, you use the word exile. Like when I was trying to understand what you meant by that, you know, for me, like trying to recollect some of those incidents in, in my own life and how I, you know, moved forward or, or failed to move forward in, in the healthiest way, um, I almost feel like those parts are not necessarily in exile, but perhaps too present. Like what I've actually exiled are all the memories or experiences where you know, somebody made me feel good or affirmed me Mm. or told me that I was worthy or Mm. that I should keep going Mm. or, you know, gave me encouragement Mm. or or mentorship. And instead, you know, you kind of lock onto those negative experiences that occur and you create narratives around them um, that end up driving your behavior well into adulthood. So have I not just, haven't I exiled like all the good things and, and overly, you know, emphasized these, you know, sort of, you know, a few incidents and and turn them into much bigger deals than they should be. Yeah, there are parts that do that. So what I was calling the critic has a habit of doing that for various reasons. And we can get into that. It doesn't want you to feel good about yourself. And so it will lock away any information that counters its narrative, like you said, of who you are and how bad you are, how nobody likes you or how dangerous the world is. And But if I were to have you focus on that part, get curious about it, ask what it's afraid would happen if it didn't do that job, 
you, there's one of three different answers you commonly get. Mm -hmm. Either it's trying to keep you small so that you don't shine and get hurt, or it's trying to motivate you, like you said, to work harder and do better. And given your life, that's probably the one. Or I um, can't remember the third, but yeah. Well, I think I, I checked both those boxes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, we can, you know, we can get into all my all my voices and all my and all my parts, but certainly uh, there is there is uh, you know a voice that's telling me you're not you know you're not you're not good enough and you and you have and, and the the love and acceptance that you seek uh, can only be earned through accomplishments right. and you know external validation, et cetera. Of course, like you never quite get there. Like yeah. you chase that forever, and I have my theories about. Why I feel that way, um, but that critic is is definitely you know powerful. And I had the same part. I came out of my family. Um, I'm the oldest of six boys, and my father was a very prominent physician researcher. And I was supposed to be that, and I had ADD, so I wasn't a good student, mm -hmm. and it drove him crazy. And and three of my brothers are big time physician researcher types. Uh, and so I came out of that relationship with a lot of burdens of worthlessness because mm. he gave me that message directly or indirectly many times. And with that burden of worthlessness, the part who carries that would be the exile that I tried to get away from all the time. But there's also a critic who is saying, echoing his voice and is trying to to goad me into achieving to counter the worthlessness mm -hmm. and to constantly get more and more achievements. And IFS wouldn't exist if that wasn't true. Cause right. I, I wouldn't. That's what makes it so difficult to overcome, right? Because this is on some level a superpower. Yeah. It's an unsustainable one and it's not a healthy one. Right. But to ask somebody to let go of that or disentangle themselves from that is a threat. You know that probably activates another part, which is saying, if you let go of that, then this whole house of cards is going to cave on top of itself because I, this is what you know. This is the this is what you you know. This is where this is, how this you is the got locus where you of are. your drive. That's right. Yes. And I totally bought into that until various circumstances made me actually do the work. And I'm here to tell you that um, it's probably been 20 years, but that critic has got a totally different job that exile worthlessness is all unburdened and I'm still cooking. It's not, yeah. it didn't. Yeah, yeah. And actually- What's the, What job does a critic have now? Let, let, me, let me finish. Uh -huh. Actually, it's much more effective because I'm a much better leader. I'm leading from what we call self now. And so part of what happened was, you know, I, that critic leaks out toward other people. And so I, when I became the leader of a community, it wasn't, helpful, I, I was alienating people and polarizing. And so I was lucky I had people come and say, you, you gotta do your work. Mm. And so having done that now, the critic- You gotta walk your own walk. You gotta walk talk. your own walk. Yeah. And, and the critic <laughs> is now, he helps me discern what's good and valuable and like this podcast mm -hmm. and what I should stay away from. He's just a discerner. Mm -hmm. And the former uh, worthless part, the shame part, now is a playful little guy. And so I don't ever anymore, I, I can say this honestly, it drives my wife crazy because um, she feels like I should yell at myself a lot more than I do. But I really don't, I don't hear that nagging critical voice anymore. Mm. The shame uh, piece I think is is huge for a lot of people. It certainly is with me and it's you know on my list of of you know voices in my head, deep shame for things I've done in the past that I can't change that I'll fixate on, um, and how that relates to you know all these other aspects of of you know all these other parts in my personality. You know that love is conditional and based on accomplishment. Excellence is mandatory. You're never going to be good enough. Um, and when you fall short, it's more than guilt. It is a feeling of of, of shame, like. Yeah. That you uh, that that drives that sense of worthlessness, um, 
and you know, and in my case, it, it it links up with you know an imposter syndrome meets you know perfectionism, control issues, and and uh, and also like a, a big you know a big part is 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 fear like dread like you should be very afraid. Catastrophe is just around the corner. Mm -hmm. It's only a matter of time you know before they find out that you don't know what you're doing and they're gonna pull the mic away from you and mm -hmm. lock you up for good. Yeah, I appreciate your disclosure about all of that. And uh, what I can say is that you're not alone. There's many people who, and I was that way. And shame is a, is a real motivator because the shame and worthlessness, especially when you're a child and you get that message is terrifying because we're born as children knowing that if my parent doesn't like me and thinks I'm worthless, I'm gonna die. And many children all over the world die because their parents don't value them. So whenever you have that burden, it's gonna be very motivating to get away from, or it's gonna you know, shut you down so you don't even try. So you're right, it's mm -hmm. a, shame is a really um, powerful burden. Yeah. So. In addition to the the exiles, we also have the managers and the firefighters, and you know, I I tend to kind of look at these things through my own experience with addiction and recovery as just mm -hmm. kind of a operating you know example of mm -hmm. how to illustrate this. But it seems to me that yes, I've you know I've exiled these certain parts of myself. Um, and you know the firefighters are are the kind of extreme parts that flare up when you get really threatened in a very particular way. And in mm -hmm. the case of, of of substance abuse, that turns into you know kind of like the binges that you were talking about, mm -hmm. right? That allow you to disassociate with whatever pain that that scenario or situation was producing, generally unconsciously in the person. Mm -hmm. And then recovery is sort of a process of having the manager take over and get everybody in line so that you can function as a you know responsible human being in the world. Well, that is the current state of the art of, of uh, addiction work is to get the manager to sit on the firefighter as well as the exile. Um, I'm trying to change that because uh, I'm trying to help people in the addictions world actually listen to and value the firefighters even though they've ruined their lives, they're really just trying to protect and then learn what they protect and heal that and then help those firefighters out of their extreme roles uh, rather than trying to control them all the time. Because you know, either you don't succeed and you just feel worse and worse because you're, you're still binging, you're, you can't do your recovery or you do succeed and then you become something of a dry drunk who's got to be careful all the time to not have that get triggered again. And so the alternative is to go to these firefighting addictive parts and like I said, learn about what they're protecting and heal that and then they, so they, they change, they take on new roles. So it's a different paradigm for understanding addiction. Yeah, it is, uh, and, and it's it's uh, it's provocative mm -hmm. for me to hear that because I am, you know, a product of of traditional twelve step, and um, it's benefited me in miraculous ways. So maybe I can push back a little bit, and then you can give me your your response to that. Um, I think there's a difference between between recovery and abstinence, and mm -hmm. the dry drunk scenario is a is a you know would fall into the, in yeah. the into the abstinence category. But if you're properly working these these tools, um, you are uh, you know you you are then moving to a place of of, of peace with yourself. Yeah, um, that I think transcends that that dry drunkness and 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 you know allows you to function I totally and you're, agree. Yeah. yeah like so you you there is like a um it's more than a armistice with your parts like right. there is a there is a a relationship with them of of understanding I guess right Yeah I overstated my case cuz I'm really trying to mm -hmm. bring something different but uh 12 step is great at certain things uh, I heard you talk to somebody recently 
about how it de-shames people, just being able to disclose what you're feeling ashamed of and have a group be very accepting of that and talk about their own. So there is a certain amount of healing your exiles that takes place in that context. And then that makes the job of the firefighter that much easier. I mean, less uh, intense, it can actually stand down better. Uh, and it also gets the critic off your back who's, before you did the 12 step, was saying, you're the only one, you're the only one who can't control it, you're just bad. Mm -hmm. uh, and now sees that it's so common. And so yes, I, there, there's a lot of benefit to 12 step, I didn't mean to. Right, so is there, is there a, a logic in, in your approach in combination with 12 step? Yes, and there are people doing that. Sort of mm -hmm. like mindfulness plus, sort yeah. of 12 step plus on top of it, like they're, mm -hmm. they can work in parallel. That's right. I'd say the only difference, uh, at least in the beginning, is to change the view of the addictive part, to really uh, listen to it and honor it for its service, like you might the military, mm -hmm. rather than see it as, uh, as the enemy. Right, to try to understand. This was, a, this was an aspect of, or I was gonna say an aspect of yourself, but you see it, this is a part that is being activated to protect you in a certain situation because it felt that you were under threat. And with that, we can be compassionate about why that, you know, that, that, that part you know, flares up in its firefighter role from time mm -hmm. to time because it, it, it really did have your best interest at heart and it didn't realize that it was actually harming you. Yeah, so as you start to do that and you change your relationship with that part, uh, and even before you've healed what drives it, just letting it know you, you understand it better and you can see how it's really trying to help even though it's not sometimes and that it's stuck in the past. Just that shift in relationship, the part starts to relax a lot. Mm -hmm. And then if you get triggered and you have that big impulse right away, you can just remind it, I know you're trying to take care of me right now, but just trust me, I don't need that right now. And, and you'll find a lot more cooperation inside because you have this sort of loving relationship with the part that ordinarily you were really you know, afraid of or angry at. It feels very esoteric. I'm imagining myself in a situation of vulnerability where suddenly there's an overwhelming you know, kind of craving or desire. Uh, and as they say in you know, the parlance of 12 step, like the train's already pulled out of the station. Like you're already in a crisis at that point. Like I don't know that a conversation with that part at that point would be adequate to mute that incredibly powerful overriding impulse. It wouldn't in the current state of the art. So, but if you've worked on it and you've built this whole new relationship with it and it knows you now and it knows it doesn't have to protect you in that same way, then you have that, that C word choice in the moment, much more than you, you mm -hmm. do when it just acts automatically and, and uh, does its, its job that way. Yeah, I think one qualitative difference between your approach and, and 12 step would be uh, the, the value in peering into your past and trying to understand it. Like there is yeah. this sort of premise in, in traditional recovery models that it, it doesn't necessarily matter why you are an alcoholic or became an alcoholic, like you can, cast your gaze into your past and, and try to grapple with that. And maybe you come up with an answer, maybe you don't, but right here today, uh, this is what you need to worry about. And here are the things that you can do, very practical mm -hmm. tools um, that can keep you on the rails and, and move you in a better direction, as opposed to your perspective, which is it's all about what happened to you in the past. And rather than, than you know um, averting your gaze there, being curious about it and really exploring it helps you to have not only a better understanding of the driving forces uh, mm -hmm. that led you to behave in this way, but to make peace with them and to be in 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 relationship with them uh, in in an honoring way, almost mm -hmm. right, yeah. uh, so that they don't act out. Yeah, and to what I call unburden these parts that are stuck in the past, in in and. 
you know, in contrast to maybe psychoanalysis or other kinds of more cerebral therapies, I wouldn't be having you try to figure out and go through your history from a rational place and try to identify the key trauma in your life. I would have you focus on the pain or the shame or the terror or the sense of re rejection or, or you know, just the, what you d described earlier, the part mm -hmm. of you that feels like, why would anybody want me? And I would have you find it in your body and I would have you just ask these questions of that place in your body and wait for the answers to come rather than think of the answer. So it's a very different approach. And people start to see themselves often as a child stuck in a bad situation in the past or a whole series of bad situations. Uh, and then I would say, how do you feel toward that boy? And if he were himself, you'd say, I feel sorry for him, I wanna help him. A lot of times you'd say, well, he's a wimp. I, I, you know, I, I just, he was too weak. He shouldn't have gotten hurt like that. So I said, could we get that part to give us a break and so we can actually help him and get him out of where he's stuck? So it's, it's a mm -hmm. much more limbic kind of emotional uh, experience than trying to figure it out from this cerebral part. Yeah, is, is that, how is that different from inner child work? Is it different just because you're recognizing all of these parts and their interplay? Mm -hmm. That's part, one of the yeah. differences is I'm seeing this as an inner ecology. And so, for example, before I would have you go to that boy, I would have you work with the part that doesn't want you to go there. And is afraid you'd be overwhelmed by what he feels. And I would spend time going over those fears and I would be addressing those fears and getting permission before I went. Because I learned the hard way that if I just had you go to that inner child and you did feel overwhelmed, these protectors will backlash and they'll, they'll make you feel terrible and ruin our relationship. Mm. So that's how it's an ecologically sensitive model. Um, I'm both working with these protectors beforehand and getting permission and then having them come in to see the change after, afterwards. So that's all one difference. The other bigger difference is in what I call self. So that, yeah, there's a lot of people that do inner child work. They're the one, the therapist is doing the talking to the inner child mm -hmm. and the child is forming a relationship with the therapist that can be healing. I'm not trying to say it's not healing, but for me, it's better if yourself is the one to take care of that child and get it out of where it's stuck. So the child comes to trust you as uh, it's the attachment figure or you know the good parent inside rather than me. Right, right. Um, how does this operate in other contexts beyond addiction? I mean, I know there's a, there's a variety of, of, of different conditions in which you've had a lot of success. Um, so maybe we could talk about like let's just talk about depression. Like, how, mm -hmm. is that have you have you noticed because you're a systems guy? Like, okay, mm -hmm. in addiction, here's what it kind of always looks like with mm -hmm. everyone between the cacophony of these various parts and the roles they're taking on. Like, what does it look like with depression? With depression, so again, you've got an exile who's very hurt or very sad, and uh, the protector is trying to keep you away from it. In depression, usually there's a part that kind of numbs you out and flattens you out, so you don't have much affect. And it's really, really afraid of that exile. It's afraid of, of the pain that would overwhelm you. And so it makes you kind of apathetic and inert a lot of the time. And then you've got the critic who's nailing you for being depressed and why can't you get over it? Why can't you just get out there? And so it's, it's a version of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we have a lot of good luck with depression. So untangling that knot involves a variety of conversations with these various parts mm -hmm. and, and, and getting them to retreat or chill out basically. Yeah, um, getting them to buy in. You know, I'm what I call a hope merchant. So if I went to that flattening part of you, I would say, you know, Rich, ask what it's afraid would happen if it lets you feel much. 
And it would say, you'd be overwhelmed and mm -hmm. you'd be pulled into the abyss and I can't let that happen. Okay, if we could heal that, so it wasn't such a threat, would you have to keep them so flat? And the part would say, no, but I don't think you can do that. If I thought you could do it, I wouldn't be doing this because none of them like their jobs. Mm -hmm. I'd say, could you give me a chance to prove that we can, because we can heal that part. So you don't have to do this job. You can be freed up to do something entirely different. Do you then uh, give, give those parts a new job, like a specific new job? Like, don't you have to direct that energy into something specific? No, I would say, Rich, ask this flattening part what it would like to do instead, if it really didn't have to do that. You'd be amazed at the answer. It's often the opposite. It wants to get you out and give you a lot of life. Yeah, so I don't have to assign any jobs. I, we just, we're, the, the concept is they're all valuable. They got stuck in these roles and we're allowing them to return to their naturally valuable states. The more I learn about this work that you do and the more I'm, I'm cognizant of the various parts and how they're impulsing me in, in various ways. Um, the more I realize you can kind of see it in other people mm -hmm. too, especially people you know well, like when they're behaving in a certain manner, if you know them well enough, you can almost see like, oh, that, that's that piece. That's not really their, that, their self, right. they're, they're, they're activated right now mm -hmm. for this reason or that reason. So I can imagine that there's a lot of benefit in, in, uh, in the context of intimacy here, mm -hmm. right? This new book that you have, um, you you are the one is really all, you're the one you've been waiting for is really kind of all about that. Like in a mm -hmm. couples therapy context, having uh, a shared understanding of each other's parts and how they, how they mm -hmm. function can be extremely beneficial in creating healthier communication because we're all, anybody who's been in a relationship, like you, you get the, your buttons get pushed or you, mm -hmm. you, know, you say something and they, they say something and then you're reacting to the various parts as opposed to seeing the self you know, beneath all the activity that's kind of you know, hanging over the whole dynamic that goes sideways. Yeah, exactly. So on a good day, you know, I, I'm a guy and I trigger my wife and uh -huh. she's Italian, so she's got this big angry part. And um, it's startling to me because it would remind me of my father when he would get so angry and it would originally hurt these little parts that were hurt by my father. Mm -hmm. And so I would come back with, try to match that energy and we would have these big fights. And it wasn't always, you know, she's probably gonna listen to this. So I, I wanna clarify, it wasn't always her that started it. Um, but now both of us can kind of say, okay, I can see she's in that part. And when you're in what I call self, it's like you have x-ray vision. You can see behind the protector to the exile that's driving the protector. You can actually have compassion in the face of the anger. Mm -hmm. And if I can stay in self and not take the bait, and not, you know, cause self is contagious and protectors are contagious. So if I react from a protective part, it's gonna escalate and we're both gonna get more and more extreme. If I can, like I said, see the pain that's driving her, stay in self and speak in this very different voice, she'll calm down pretty quick. And again, I wanna make it clear, it's both ways. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so that's one, very valuable aspect of IFS in couples. But let me go back to something I was saying earlier, because most of us come into relationships with this exile part that feels worthless and is looking to our partner or feels terrified as looking to our partner to take care of that part of right. us. Right, right, right. And our partner can't do that. And our partner at some point will trigger those same parts in the same way. And we might even be looking for a partner who resembles the person we got it from because mm -hmm. we're still desperate to get dad to tell me I'm valuable rather than, so somebody resembles dad and they're, they love me. Oh, that's so, you know, I, I just feel wonderful after I feel that from somebody. But then 
she yells at me like that, and oh, I'm back. So she can't be the one. It's got to be somebody else out there that I got to find. So what I try to do is a, a U-turn in, in couples' focus so that each partner becomes what I call the, the primary caretaker or attachment figure for their own parts, which frees up the partner to be the secondary caretaker because most all of us have that reversed. We mm. want our partner to take care of our parts or we want some affair to do it or some, you know, that it's got to come from an external person. Mm -hmm. But if, if you Yeah, because do that, we don't want to take responsibility for our own shit. Right. Come on, who wants right. to do that, right? It's much more fun to get into a relationship with somebody and project onto that person a, a, a fantasy or an idealized version of, of who you think they are, or who you would like them to be, mm -hmm. and then charge them with the responsibility of healing all of your wounds, yeah. right? And when two people are doing that simultaneously, it's combustible, right? It's and a setup, <laughs> yeah, it's a setup. Yeah. yeah, so it becomes tricky. I would imagine when you have couples come in, two people, you have, you know, it's a very complicated knot to untie and to, you know, gain some level of clarity. And then beyond that, once you have that understanding, those 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 buttons are so deeply ingrained, right? Like mm -hmm. uh, to not react when it gets pushed in the way that you have historically your entire life. I feel like an intellectual understanding of the dynamic will only get you so part far. of the way there. Right. Like I think you know, mindfulness and meditation mm -hmm. play a big role mm -hmm. in just giving you that extra pause so mm -hmm. you can kind of calculate your environment mm -hmm. a little bit better and calibrate your, your response. Um, but that identification piece that you're talking about, like, oh, that's the critic or that's the this mm -hmm. and that, you know, that's what's operating here. Yeah, I'm, on a mm -hmm. good day, we get into it. We both say, okay, time out. We get away from each other. We both go inside. We find the parts that we're doing the talking. We try to get them to tell us about the parts they're protecting. We go in and let them know we get that that felt bad, but let me handle this. You guys don't have to handle it. So from self, I'm saying that. Mm -hmm. And I feel this shift. I feel that rush of anger just kind of separate. And I'll, I'll say, I'll, you know, we'll talk to you later. Let me go back. Mm -hmm. And so I go back in a very different place and she does too. And things that used to take days to get over take out, you know, right, the most half an hour. Yeah, half sure. Hour. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, how do you work with somebody who has compartmentalized that that piece of themselves so so completely, such that you know the request to bring it into the light or be in conversation with it? Is is equal to, is, is almost like a death threat, right? Like the mm -hmm. like they're holding on so tightly mm -hmm. to this thing that mm -hmm. makes them, you know, they think makes them who they are, and to relinquish control or to have a different relationship with whatever it is makes it, it literally feels like you're going to die, yeah. right? Because that is part and parcel of how they've constructed their identity to keep themselves safe. That's right, and. Again, you're using the pronoun they, but it's just a part. So there is a part that's been running their life and thinks it's them and is very attached to being in charge. And so the idea that there are other parts is very threatening to it. The idea that it's not who Rich is, uh, like you said, it can be terrifying, mm -hmm. like they're gonna die if they really even look at that. So there are some clients like that that come in and I'm very gently just connecting with them. I'm not bringing up parts. I'm just helping them trust that it's a safe environment. And then at some point, I might say something like, you know, I, I noticed that uh, there's a part of you that really has gotten you where, you where you are now and it's been terribly valuable in many ways. And I'll bet it's really tired because I, I bet it's just constantly striving and working and, uh, we, we love that part, it's so valuable and it's done such a good job, but just check and see if it might want a little bit of a break mm -hmm. and, and might want to check around and see if it's, if it's totally alone in there or if there might be other 
parts of you or even uh, uh, you who could be helping it. So it's a kind of a sales pitch really. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. But to do it in a very gentle, non-judgmental, non-pathologizing way. Loving way, we love this Instead part. Instead of, you know, that, that thing that you do is hurting everybody around you <laughs> right, all the exactly. time. Like that doesn't work. And that, you know, and, and that, that's a, a relic of the 12 step movement too, where you're to confront people about how, how much damage their activity has caused. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a big mistake in general. I mean, sometimes it works, it like shakes people out of there, but a lot of times people just get more entrenched in their protectors. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, there is, you know, a core piece obviously is, is the is the inventory, right? Mm -hmm. Which nobody really tells you what you can and can't write, but right. you're meant to go on this inward journey to, you know, really, you know, tabulate your behavior over time. Um, and I think there's a lot of value in that because mm -hmm. it does snap you out of whatever identity mode you're in about who you think you are and, and sheds light on the reality of how you actually behave. And that allows you to then see how that impacts other people. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in lockstep with that, you make your amends into the world. That's right. So explain to me what's missing in that piece. Is it the sense that it's like, uh, there's, a, there's a harshness to it or you know, what would you? You know, there can be, I, I think there's, 12 step approaches that aren't harsh, that really just do try to do that inventory from a mindful place and not, the shame isn't so, so involved in it. Um, and even if you do it softly, I mean, a lot of times the addiction is a way to stay away from even looking at all the stuff you've done in your life. So just pushing somebody to go back and look can be very, very triggering for them and, and bring forth all kinds of shame. So um, I don't have an argument with what you just described. Mm -hmm. It's more uh, when somebody's in denial, the aggressive approach to that denying part, rather than I can see there's a part that doesn't wanna look at any of this. Let's get to know that part and see what it's afraid would happen. Mm -hmm. And then I would reassure the part that there's a lot we can handle and I'd be right there to handle, help it with that. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I understand that. And, and it's all founded on this idea that there are no bad parts, right? right. The title of one right. of the other books, um, having a compassionate relationship with all of these parts. But is there an argument to be had that, that maybe some of these parts are bad? Like what about the, the, the person who has the part in them that, that makes them you know, go shoot up a school or you know, perpetrate a, a, a violent crime on another individual? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. is it your argument that we should have compassion for that piece and try to understand why it, it, it drove the self to act out in that way? Or can we not label that as something pernicious that we need to, you know, override and, and, and overcome? You can, but it hasn't been working that well. So I, believed that, okay, maybe these critics are good and maybe these binging parts are good, but what about those kinds of people that you just described? And to test that, I consulted to a, a um, treatment center for, for offenders, sex offenders for a number of years and worked with a lot of those perpetrators. And we would find the perpetrating part and they of course felt totally ashamed of it. And so we had to work a lot to the point where they could get curious about it and then start asking these same kind of questions. And it would show them scenes in their childhood when they were being perpetrated, not necessarily in the same way. And that this part decided, I've got to protect this kid, looked around the room and said, who has power in this room? It's the person who's hurting me. I'm gonna take in that energy to try and protect the kid from that parent mm -hmm. and then get stuck with this, this, per, this desire to hurt people, the desire to, to hurt little kids even, uh, get stuck with that burden. And then, you know, the person goes into life and tries to keep it at bay and lock it up and it just gets more extreme. Right, right, that, that, so, that tends not to work, right? Yeah. So the. The point of all of that is once I got that, 
that's when I could start saying, okay, maybe there are no bad parts. Uh-huh. And, I, and I would go to other, you know, I've been in prisons, I've been working with murderers, I've been. Does that, does that work? Have you noticed whether that works in a, in a case of, of true sociopathy or somebody who is, you know, uh, completely lacking in empathy altogether? Is it, is yeah. it a case of understanding why they lack empathy, you know, getting to know those parts? It's and a case getting to them to a place where their self can experience empathy again. Yes, yes, it's a case. I mean, that's of, revolutionary in terms of how that that contradicts. It's a, very a revolutionary, model. and um, it's it's if you see them as a sociopath, you're going to have one response. If you say, "Oh, there's a part that protects them, that doesn't let them feel anything or care anything about anybody, and just tries to get whatever they want, even if it's destructive to other people." And it's a protector. And let's get to know it and see where it's stuck in the past and help it, which is what I've been doing with a lot of these kinds mm. of people. Um, I know that this modality is, is, you know, like we said, you know, kind of at odds with traditional methods. Uh, so what is the, like, how is this being received in the, the broader, you know, scientific community in, in your field? Has that changed? I mean, there, there is, because it's so different and what you're proposing is, you know, at odds with so many, so many of the, the kind of principles. It's very radical and, uh, you know, I told you this is our 40th anniversary of the mm-hmm. beginning of it. And so for probably 30 years, I labored in obscurity and I got attacked by those kinds of people and seen as dangerous and, uh, for whatever reason, the last decade, it's caught fire. Mm. And I don't really know why I've tried to figure it out. Not as much, like I was in academia, I was in the Department of Psychiatry, and then tried to present there and got attacked and just decided, okay, I'm gonna go grassroots. So since then, I've been, the last 30 years, I've just been trying to bring it to therapists and, uh, and now it's everywhere. Now, I don't know why. It's being embraced. Yeah. And is there a different narrative within that more traditional culture that's changing or is there still resistance? No, it's not. No, they're still very uh, wedded to the DSM and seeing all these things as diseases or disorders and uh, it's still very simplistic that mm-hmm. way. In other words, diagnose, prescribe yeah. um, without, uh, you know, understanding like when you, like what is the, the emotional experience of, of diagnosing a patient when they hear that diagnosis and, and, and what that does to someone's, you know, awareness of like who they are and what they're capable of and what they're not capable of. Well, um, you know, for some diagnoses people attach to and they feel like, okay, I've got this condition. That's why I'm doing this stuff. And it's a relief in, in a sense and some of the 12 step does that, you know, you're an addict and all of that. Uh, but it doesn't really help you change your relationship with the parts that are making you do this. Mm-hmm. It just kind of, it helps you with your shame about it, but you still feel like a broken person. You feel like there's something wrong with you and that uh, it's not, you know, very pessimistic about changing it other than medication or um, 20 years of talk therapy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and your perspective, there's, there's, there isn't that immutability, obviously. In, in the diagnostic yeah. stuff? You know, these, diagnostics, these, these diagnostic categories just represent clusters of protectors usually that, you know, they're pretty good descriptions of common clusters of protectors but that's all they are. And, and so instead, uh, we go to the protectors and we start to, to help them trust they don't have to keep doing this. Mm. How does the, the ego work within all of this? The ego as we sort of conventionally understand it, um, is there a locus of that in this model or you think differently around that? Like explain your yeah, so, view on that. What people traditionally call the ego for me is a cluster of little managers. They're, they're the parts that you're most identified with. Some, you know, some think they are you, like we were saying, and they, they run your life and they're 
you know, the voices in your head that are trying to figure out when you're in a dilemma, which way to go. It's often these two different managers trying to, both trying to protect, but in opposite ways. So that's what both uh, psychology and also spirituality see the ego as, as uh, often a pest, you know, that gets in the way. And, uh, and so I'm trying to also bring this compassionate awareness of the ego because it's, it's the parts of you that, that jumped into those roles to just manage your life mm -hmm. when you were young and they've been doing it ever since and they're tired too. And they get a bad name all the time. So instead of, of uh, maligning them, again, it's the same thing. Like go in, understand it. Why is it behaving? Why is this part showing up in this way? Yeah, what's it afraid would happen? That's the, one of the mm -hmm. big questions for protectors. What's it afraid would happen if it didn't do this job? And in answering that, you're gonna hear either about the exiles it protects or about some firefighter it's polarized with and is afraid it'll take over if it doesn't keep you busy mm -hmm. writing books or whatever. Right. You know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I get it. And then and then there's the uh there's the saboteur, right? Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about that. I mean that's that's the 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 part that is uh, you know always undermining you mm -hmm. uh, at at just the opportune moment. Yeah, if you happen to have a, that part, we could ask it what it's afraid would happen if it didn't. And generally, uh, it's afraid you would succeed. And if you succeeded, you'd be seen. And if you're seen, you'd be attacked. Or mm -hmm. Some version of that. So it's keeping you small. It's keeping you small. Yeah. yeah. To keep the risk the risk level like low, uh -huh. the stakes the stakes being low. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that's that's cool about all of this is once somebody has had experience with sessions and sort of been you know led down the path of you know having an experience with with uh, yourself or or one of the other practitioners of IFS, there's a whole sort of set of tools that then can be practiced by the individual itself. Like it becomes a very practical kind of mm -hmm. habit-based tool that yeah. one can use on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, I said earlier, it's become a kind of life practice. So when I wake up in the morning, uh, I'll spend a little time in bed, just checking in with the parts that I've been working with and seeing how they're doing today and do they need anything. And have, have any of them reverted to their past roles or brought their burdens back? Or, um, and, and I'll just make sure they know that I haven't forgotten about them. Because for me, these are real. These are not imaginary. This is a real inner family that we, we all live with. And just like your external family, if you neglect them, they're going to get extreme. Mm -hmm. So there's a ongoing, it doesn't take long usually, you know, maybe 10 minutes, but just uh, staying connected, reminding them, okay, today I'm gonna be doing this interview with Rich and I can handle it. You, don't, you guys don't have to jump in. You don't have to, you can just let me stay because it always goes better if you let me stay. And we might even rehearse a little bit. And so, and, and so when I get here and having lunch, I'm talking to them about, it's okay, it's gonna be okay, just let me stay. And then I stay with those C word qualities. I'm, you probably have sensed, I'm pretty calm, I'm pretty confident, I'm pretty um, clear and, and compassionate. And there's like eight C words that, that, that describe what I'm calling self. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm creative, I'm Connected, I forgot, I think I just Calm, compassionate, uh, curious, clear, connected, uh, courageous. Yeah. Is that eight? That was the one I missed. Yeah, yeah I think that's eight. Yeah, so. And every, every self in its purest state, uh, those, are, those, those eight C's kind of uh, are, are, are prominent qualities. Yeah, there are other qualities like joy and perspective and but they don't begin with the letter C. I like, you know, alliteration. Mm -hmm. And these eight are the ones that are most relevant to the healing endeavor. So, you know, um, I can check very quickly how much I'm in my body and self 
versus there's some part that's taken over. And you get a real palpable sense of the difference. And if I feel like, you know, if you said something that triggered me, I would notice and then I would just say, just, just let me stay, just mm -hmm. relax a little bit. And now my parts trust that it's better if they do that. It's taken a lot of work, a lot of those morning connections and, and a lot of unburdenings, uh, but now they basically trust me most of the time. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's interesting. Uh, I think there's something really beautiful about the idea that the unencumbered, unadulterated, you know, uncompromised, pristine self that lives within all of us um, is characterized by all of these, you know, laudable traits, right? Mm -hmm. Like within that, there seems to be a certain spirituality, right? Like mm -hmm. if all human beings have this within them and that's somewhat of a, a, a natural law from your perspective mm -hmm. and, and something that shares and unites all of us and our path really, or our journey is to either, you know, is to rediscover that within ourselves and express mm -hmm. that. Like, I think that's a, you know, there is a, there is a you know, a, a, a sort of, you know, non-denominational, uh, you know, spiritual beauty in all of it. Thank you, it's true. And when I entered all this, I was a scientist, non-spiritual person. I come from a atheistic father and, and uh, but the big challenge for me was as I started to see self in people that had no business any of, having any of those qualities given their histories, I couldn't explain it from traditional psychology, which believes in attachment theory and attachment theory says, for you to have any of those C word qualities, you needed to have a certain kind of parenting during a critical period in your childhood. And if you didn't get that, then you gotta get it from a therapist or you gotta get it from a spouse or it it's, comes from a relationship, mm -hmm. it's not inherent in us. And I was finding people that had been abused on a daily basis just by getting some parts to open space, the same person would pop out in them that was popping out in all these other less abused clients. So I couldn't reconcile that until people started saying, well, maybe this is like Buddha nature, or maybe this is like Atman, or maybe this mm -hmm. is like Christ consciousness. Or it seems like every spiritual tradition has a word for it, whereas almost no other psychologies do. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. then I started to say, okay, I can ground it over there and it turns out you don't have to meditate 10 years to get to it. It's right beneath the surface. Mm. And of course, once you, you, you create a healthy um, matrix of relationships with all of these parts and the self can emerge and express those eight C's, not only are you becoming a more you know, fulfilled, self-actualized, healthy, um, human being who can contribute positively to the world, there's a whole downstream uh, you know, series of implications to that because it ends up, obviously you're affecting all the people that you're interacting with in a positive way as well. Yeah, and as I'm getting older and uh, trying to figure out what I want as my legacy, I'm moving this to larger and larger systems because I think the world needs isn't just my system, but this is one of many systems that can actually make a difference. And so I'm trying to, uh, to bring more self-leadership to the world basically. And, um, and, you know, having some success doing that. And cause I do, like I said earlier, self is contagious. So for example, we have, we're working on now, uh, uh, training for executive coaches so that CEOs will be more self-led and that will be spread throughout the company. And, mm. uh, and I'm working with a lot of the top social activists in the country now. So they're not doing their activism from righteous parts, but. Right, martyrdom, like basically a, a, an expression of their, their pain body. That's right. right. Yeah. And it often is. And as we heal that, those painful parts, then they can lead from self and they are much more effective. How does one gauge their, their progress? Like I've found that often it's others who are the more reliable, effective mirrors of, of one's personal growth because on a day-to-day -day basis, it's hard to really know that within yourself. 
Um, how does one know when they're they're moving in the right direction, or you know, is there is there a situation in which you've arrived at at a place of of well being, or is this just layer after layer until you know yeah. you expire? <laughs> right. Well, I've been at it forty years, yeah. and I'm still finding parts that need to be healed. But um, to answer your question. I don't get triggered like I used to by so many things. So some of how you can judge it is, are the same things triggering me and mm -hmm. it's just not the case anymore. So that's one measure. Yeah. Um, there seems to be a, a, a sort of anthropomorphizing of all of these parts, right? Like, do you have people give them names? Do you have them conjure faces and personalities for them? Like I'm reminded of, of I think it was Elizabeth Gilbert who was talking about like you hear a lot of this in the context of of creatives going to war with their like resistance or um, writer's block and and you know kind of giving names to that and saying you know Elizabeth Gilbert's example is we're going on a road trip we're going to drive across America and like okay buddy you know like the 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 you know the part to use your phraseology that is telling her she's worthless and can't write and has nothing to say and you know blah 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 um, her way of explaining it was like you can come on you're going to come like you're with me like right. we're in partnership right. right like i'm not you know like pretending you don't exist like you're here yeah. uh, but you just can't sit in the passenger seat like you got to get in the back seat right. and uh, and if you start piping up like then i'm going to you know put you in the trunk or or whatever like I, so there's I a hope recognition she didn't say the trunk but yeah yeah so <laughs> it's like we come up with all these creative ways of 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 saying something sort of similar to what you're talking about right that yeah. isn't repressing or denying or ignoring or compartmentalizing this aspect that we're very aware is looming in there, but finding a way to communicate with it so it feels heard, yeah. but not empowered to you know exert itself in a way that's going to be damaging. Yeah, and and she's been using IFS for a number of years mm -hmm. now, so uh, that that's why she talked about it that way. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's cool. In fact, I'm yeah. gonna interview her for a thing I'm doing, I think in a week or two. Uh -huh. yeah. So I. Th so it, it is her, yeah, I think I'm remembering that story right from. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, except yeah. the trunk, I don't think she would say. Oh, maybe, yeah, maybe not. But <laughs> but I, I just do, I do remember that idea of like, I'm not saying you can't come. Right. Like you're coming, yeah, just we, shut up or like. We like you, but you can't drive. <laughs> yeah, we just yeah, aren't gonna let you drive. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Or maybe it was, uh, like you can come, but you can't like choose the songs on the radio. Could be that. Something like that, yeah, I can't yeah. remember. Yeah. Um, and then of course, Stephen Pressfield calls it resistance. And then the flip side is the muse. And that made me think about um, the sort of the converse of that idea, which is adopting an alter ego to go, you know, kind of do the thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like almost in, or you put on your armaments or your, your, you're 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 battle ready by you know adopting a persona that is kind of an extreme extrapolation of who you are in order to go put yourself in a challenging or difficult situation. Does that mesh up with like your model at all? No, that kind of violates the spirit of it. Interesting. So it's really to help those armored parts trust there is this other person in there who can handle like three of those eight C words are courage, confidence, and clarity. So that's all you need. Myself right? can be totally fierce if necessary. Mm -hmm. it does I don't have to rely on an armored part. And if I'm going into a dangerous situation, I can ask my exiles to just go into a kind of waiting room. They don't have to be here even, uh, and let me handle this situation. So we're really trying to help these protectors trust self and mm. not feel like they've got to. Yeah, interesting. Cause yeah, I'm, I'm wondering like, so it was Kobe Bryant who had the Mamba mentality mm -hmm. or David Goggins becomes Goggins and the Iron Cowboy becomes the Iron Cow. Like they're, they're, they're sort of trying to, you know, channel a larger than life version of themselves. So what is, you know, what is, what's, Wrong is the wrong word, but maybe. Well, that's like, different. That's different. That's kind of what I'm getting at, though. Yeah. So, you know, I played college football at my size. And so there was a part of me 
that I just hated. My father was full of rage and loved running full speed into guys twice my size. Mm -hmm. And I would call on that part and it kept me alive. It kept me from being damaged. Um, so in those kind of situations where uh, it's, it's fine to call on those parts, um, right, like an athlete who's trying to channel a superhuman performance. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, unless in doing that, you're perpetuating this sense that they don't know you and that they don't trust you and they feel like they they have to protect you all the time. Right, you're the you're the you're the Wizard of Oz, right? right. Who's behind the curtain? Yes, yeah, who's like, feeble and and in 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 incontinent. <laughs> It's compared to the alter ego, right? <laughs> At my age, that's, yeah. uh, that's not funny. So, <laughs> um, so it's, we're helping them become like volunteer, a volunteer fire department rather than firefighters that are on duty constantly. Right, right, right. But so you're able to call, summon them call as needed. Them, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I still have that part. And when I'm, now I sometimes play basketball. It can still, I still like it when it takes over. Sure. Sure. But it doesn't have to protect me all the time. Yeah. Um, well, I think it would be cool to. Are, are you, we talked about you maybe you know taking me through an exercise, or you, would love you to. willing to do that? Totally. All right. Well, let's let's try this out. How do we do this? Do you have something you want to explore? Um, We've talked about a bunch of different parts of you. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, you know I've done so much work in, in so many different modalities over the years and have grown tremendously, but I still get tripped up by certain things that you know I feel, I, I beat myself up then for not being, having grown more. I still, uh, you know, I still am driven, but well, I'll just give you kind of a bunch of stuff and maybe you can extract from that okay. what might be worthy of focusing on. I mean, I still, I've gotten a lot better, but I still, you know, externalize this, uh, you know, this sense that that my value is calibrated to, you know, my accomplishments, or that, you know, love is is conditional as opposed to something that I should just be able to receive. Mm -hmm. um, you know that that no matter what I do, I'm never going to be good enough. That uh, you know you should be very afraid because it's all going to fall apart. All these stuff, these yeah. things I've already I've already mentioned. I think I have a, a, a you know I walk around with a little bit of a self conscious protective shell around mm -hmm. me, yeah. and you know on some level I'm still the scared kid at the bus stop that used to get That's beat right. up a little bit. That's right, um, and I know that. You know, I've I've heard you do this exercise with other people, and often it's it starts with um, communicating to that five year old version of yourself. And and I was reflecting on that a little bit and realizing like I don't have any memories. Like I don't I don't have like I don't remember being five. Like mm -hmm. some of my earliest memories are are much later than that. Yeah, and you may not have visual memory, but you may have sensate memory. We just don't know until we mm -hmm. get in there. But so far you've mentioned four or five different protectors we could start with. So there, you think you mentioned the critic, and then there's the striver that's trying to get achievements so you feel better about yourself. And then there's that shell. And there was one other that I don't remember. Mm, I don't know, imposter syndrome, that, yeah, perfectionism, yeah. control. Okay. You know, I can I can keep going by the so, way, but so like, <laughs> just, just pick one of those. It's, it's a yeah. It's like it's that thing of like I've got a lot. Of, I feel like I have a, a a pretty good level of self awareness around mm -hmm. all this stuff. Um, but self awareness by itself doesn't sure help them yes, change. Of course, right? Yeah. And and I did just do um, some pretty intense work around family of origin stuff, mm -hmm. and 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 so I I feel like I'm better armed around a lot of the childhood trauma mm -hmm. issues and, mm -hmm. and I've been able to um, uh, give myself a little bit more leeway and compassion mm -hmm. than I was able to earlier and also um, view my parents in a much more forgiving mm -hmm. and compassionate way. Cause yeah, I, have, I do have like sort of latent anger that flares mm -hmm. up that I think is related to that in mm -hmm. certain ways that still comes up from time to time. Okay, all we need is a starting point. So among all those protectors, is there one you'd like to start with? I think the 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 one that um, 
is probably the most important is is the protector that won't let me receive or or give love or has that conditional relationship right. around around it. Okay. That has to do with worthiness, of course. We don't have to figure it out right now. We're just going to start by focusing on that feeling or however you experience that pr- protective part and find it in your body or around your body. Yeah, it's hard because there's cameras and there's lights and I'm sitting that, across yeah. from you and I'm caught up in my head around like, it, this is gonna, this is a public thing. It, and you it know, it's not, like, there's a lot of layers here that maybe might prevent me from totally being it, able it to- It may not work at all. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, there's no pressure and uh, I assume we can edit some of this out sure. if it goes sure, sure. places you don't want it to. Um, it's not so much that, it's, it's more about whether I'll be able to, uh, Again, it's the it, like I have to perform now, right? Yeah, yeah, I got to yeah. be a good right. performer for you, and for the audience. Uh, it's more about like that self consciousness of of being watched that is preventing me from. Well, maybe, maybe going we should start deep. with that one. Why don't we start with that self conscious part? All right. So see if you can find it in your body or around your body. I don't know. I also feel my skeptic coming up here too. A little <laughs> maybe bit. we should start with uh, it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I and I want to be a good, I a good test case. So I want to tell you where it is, even though I'm not sure where it is. Just any. Sense I would say in general, probably around you know my heart, All right. my sternum. So focus on it there, and tell me how you feel toward it. Are we still talking about the self conscious part, or what are we talking about? Um, I think the, the 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 worthiness of love part is probably right. more at the heart of. So that's where things. you find him. Yeah, and as you notice him there, how do you feel toward him as you sense him? I mean, there's a sense of 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 um, there's competing feelings. On the one hand, there's there's sadness that mm-hmm. there's this mm-hmm. person that feels like they're not worthy unless mm-hmm. they're doing things that mm-hmm. you know people approve of right and how exhausting mm-hmm. that must be totally um, and then there's the other side of it which is yeah but this is what makes you you and look right. at all the amazing things that you've been able to do as a result of it this is your this is your best friend and and your superpower yeah and you should hold on tightly to that and so, it's okay because it's okay it's okay if you're not able to uh, receive love because you, because you're putting something good into the world and that can be your legacy and that's mm-hmm. enough. Okay. So we're gonna ask the part that just said all that to just give us a little space for five minutes to actually get to know this one in your heart and we get that it feels really dependent on that to do what you're doing, but let it know that if it lets us help this one, you're not gonna stop doing what you're doing, you'll just do it more effectively, I promise. I've heard that before and I don't believe it. I, that's fine not to believe yeah. it, but just ask if it would give us a chance. Mm-hmm. And okay. it doesn't have to if it's, if it's too determined that this would be too threatening to your system. But if it's willing to let us go with compassion to this one, um, you can lead the system more effectively than this part. So, I mean, I can, do I say that out loud? Don't have to, you can yeah. say it inside. Okay. But if, if it's willing, you'll notice a shift and you won't have that same need to keep it going. Say it's holding on pretty tight. Okay, then we could shift to it. Mm-hmm. The okay. one, the one who really thinks you have to have this other to, to get anywhere. So, but, in other words, have me speak for that part. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I might even, I could talk to it directly for a second if you want. Sure. Okay. So you're the part of Rich that really thinks um, he needs to feel all this bad feeling to be motivated to do his job and that 
that's enough. He doesn't need to have love in his life otherwise because he's bringing this to the world. Is that right? You're that part? A little bit. I, I would, yeah. I mean, I think. Just let, I it, just let it speak. Don't speaking, think. Yeah. So you're the Listen, part that tells you know, him that. Rich is, he's got issues. Let me tell you. Yeah. Right. He, uh, he's, he's weak. He's a little too sensitive. And uh, if I didn't show up, you know, this guy might've not ever moved out of the house. And so I boost him every day. I get him out in the world. I get him to hustle and like, look what I've been able to manifest as a result of that. Um, and, uh, you know, just keeping him shy of, of that, you know, that prize that he's reaching for uh, gets him out of bed every day. Okay. So I do believe you deserve a huge amount of credit for all you just described. All right. Are you tired though? Yeah, am I, is it the part now or is it yeah, the self? as the part. Stay well, with the, the part. The part is indefatigable. Okay. I think the self is tired. Just, just yeah. let the part speak though. Yeah. Is that true that you're, you're not tired? You, you, you just can keep going forever? Or are there times where you get a little tired? It's a drag, but uh, I got a lot of endurance and, uh, and I get, uh, I get a kick out of the suffering. Out of, you get a kick out of Rich's suffering? Yeah. And what's, what's the kick about? Uh, because through that suffering, he, uh, he learns more about himself. Okay. So you're afraid if he gave up the suffering, he wouldn't be learning much? The suffering is the engine. Oh, well, mm -hmm. that's different. It's not just learning, but he wouldn't be motivated in the way he is without the suffering. If he's not suffering, then he's not working hard enough. Yeah, okay. All right, and how old do you think Rich is? Mm. Don't think, just let it come. Uh, probably 15. Yeah, okay. So, it's. I get that when he was 15, you really had to do this for him. But would it shock you to learn that he's considerably older than that? He might think he's older than that, but I know that he's still 15. You know that he's still 15. And he's still as vulnerable as he was then, or what's your sense? Yeah, it's hard to parse the self from the part. Um, Just let the part speak. But the part, uh, the part probably, you know, is the, the part is operating under the assumption that nothing's changed. Right that he's still in that kind mm -hmm. of vulnerability. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So I understand why you're still taking this position that was so necessary back then. But if you really trusted that he wasn't so vulnerable now as he was then, would that make a difference in your attitude? It would, but you're gonna have to prove, prove to me it. that he's trustworthy. Yeah. So tell me more about why you think he's not trustworthy. Yeah, it's, that's, a, that's a hard one to answer. Because you don't want to disclose something or just- No, not um, sure? no, not because I don't want to, because I'm trying to identify like if, so the part, so that part- um, It doesn't trust you. Doesn't trust me because at 15, I had a lot of vulnerabilities and weaknesses that were exploited. That's right by others uh, and, and I can't see the person, the self that is operating today. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, he still lives back there. He, do, he doesn't know you. He doesn't know who you are. He still thinks you're 15 and as vulnerable as you were and that you couldn't protect him back then. So, we can keep going or we could mm -hmm. shift, but if you wanted to keep going, I would ask how you feel toward that 15 year old boy. I feel really, I have deep sadness for that. Like compassion person. sadness? Yeah, yeah. Could you let him know that and just see how he reacts to your compassion? There's a, um, a, a gratitude, I think, just for being seen. That's right. Because the feeling of being invisible. Totally. Yeah. So let them know you get 
back then, he was feeling very invisible, but that you see him right now. Mm -hmm. I see him too. Yeah. And that you care about him. Hmm. Just see if there's more he wants you to know about what it was like back there for him. You know, I think a, 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 a deep uh, loneliness and sensitivity and, and feeling, feelings of, of being misunderstood and, mm -hmm. and not being heard or, or, or recognized, but mm -hmm. instead sort of being uh, shouldered with expectations that, that didn't really meet that didn't really um, honor or recognize like the, the person, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah. So as you're getting this, how are you feeling toward him? Uh, if there's a, there's a, there's a feeling of calm, sort of a catharsis. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really helping him to have you witness him this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you see him right now or you just sense him in there? No, I can see him. And how close would you say you are to him in terms of feet away? Oh, just, you know, right next to him. And how is he reacting to your proximity? I think he's uh, uh, unsure, mm -hmm. not, not necessarily trusting. This is new for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're not gonna push this. We're just gonna be with him in this caring way until he starts to trust it a little more in whatever way feels right to you, Rich, to let him know that you, he can trust you and just take your time. He can trust you and he doesn't have to perform for you. He, you're just there with him because you care about him. Yeah, I think that, that he's comforted by that. He's, you know, he's scared and uncertain. Mm -hmm. So and feels alone in that and 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 um, and very private in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So ask if he would like you to show up this way for him more than you have. There's a resistance to that. Yeah. From not from him, from some other part. Just ask. Um, it's more of a you don't understand. From him. Of, yeah. So ask him about that. Yeah, where does that come from? Yeah. You know, it's 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 a lot of uh it's all about like legacy burdens, really. Great. You know, which you talk about. Yeah. Great, yeah. So what's he saying about the legacy burdens? I have to be this person. Okay. Um, I'll make it work. Yeah. You know, it'll be fine, just leave me alone. So he carries all of that, mm -hmm. yeah. And ask, since he got that from other people, it's not his, does he like having to carry all that? No, but it doesn't feel safe for him to be who he wants to be. In that context, in mm -hmm. that time period, is that right? Yeah. So ask him if he'd like you to take him out of there to a safe place. Yeah, where? that's what he wants. Okay. So are you ready to do that or is he ready to yeah. go? Yeah. All right, so let's take him, could be the present, it could be to your house, it could be a fantasy place, wherever he'd like to go. Specifically? Yeah. Just ask him. I don't know that there's a, a specific place other than away from where he is. So just take him, just yeah. to, well, bring him here for now. All right. And tell me when he's here. Okay. How does he like being here? He's confused. <laughs> okay. What's he confused about? Well, why are there other lights? And it was 1980 a second ago, and right. now there's a lot of stuff that is unrecognizable. <laughs> yeah, well, that makes sense. He'd be yeah. confused. Uh huh. A lot of this didn't exist in 1980. Right. Okay. But does he trust that he's not out, in, not in that time anymore? Yeah. And how's that for him? Relief. Yeah. Does he trust you care about him? I think so. Because just ask I just, him. Because it was just demonstrated. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, just ask him though. Yeah. 
So tell him he never has to go back and you're going to be looking after him. And ask with that if he's ready to unload this legacy burden that's uh, made him feel so bad. I think the there is a, a welcoming of that, um, but also at that age, the 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 legacy burden or expectations weren't something that that I was fully conscious of at the time. I mean, it's operating in my unconscious, but I wouldn't have been able to label it or understand it. So okay. I think there's a he's not quite understanding okay. the proposition. Let's let's put it this way. Ask him to scan his body and see if there's anything he carries that doesn't belong to him. Yeah, there's a lot. And where does he carry all that in his body or on his body? I think it's 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 almost everything. It's a sense of of feeling trapped in the wrong life. Okay. Yeah. And now that he's here with you and you're gonna be taking care of him, would he like to unload that? Yes. All right, and ask him what he'd like to give it all up to, light, water, fire, wind, earth, anything else? I think the water. Okay. So set that up, take him to water and tell him to just let all that out of his body, off of his body, let the water take it. No need to carry that anymore because he's not living back there anymore. Mm -hmm. And just do that until it's all out of him. Okay. How's he feeling now? Lighter. Yeah. Freer. Yeah. Liberated. Good. Yeah. Hope, hopeful. Good. And tell him now if he wants to, he can invite qualities into his body he'd like to have to replace all that stuff. You can just see what comes into them. Yeah, I think a, 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 an empowering sense of agency and mm -hmm. self-efficacy and permission mm -hmm. really is a big one. Mm -hmm. That it's okay for That's him right. to be who he is. That's right. So how's he doing now? He's doing better. Good. Yeah. So now let's invite all these protectors that we met to come in and see, they don't have to protect him anymore. There might be other parts, but, but that he's doing well, particularly the one that led us to him and just see how they react. I think it's a, a situation of, of like confusion, like, okay, what are we gonna do now? But also like, all right, like, I guess this is, this is cool. Yeah. Seems like he's doing all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, what, am, what are we going to do now is a really good question. So they yeah. can all start thinking about new roles if they want. What would they like to do if they didn't have to be these these guys? Uh, a source of empowerment. There you go. Yeah, that's right. So thank them for letting us do this. Mm -hmm. is actually, quite a big piece of work. Yeah, and. Uh, just check and see how it's feeling in there, if there's anything else we need to do before we come back out. No, I feel like the, the reassigned roles need to be just providing him with not just support and encouragement, but with the tools that he's going to need to yeah. be able to stand on his own two feet and, and explore his own way. Yeah, and are you willing to do that for him? Mm -hmm. So let him know. Does that feel complete for now? Yeah, that was pretty good. <laughs> Come on out and how are you feeling? I feel good, yeah. I feel good. Um, no, it was, it was uh, surprisingly meaningful. Um, I think it was a little bit impacted by just, you know, the the construct that we're in right now. Right. Like I probably would have been more emotional if we, I was sitting in your office and right. no one was watching. I, I <laughs> so could I tell. had a self-consciousness around that, I think. Yeah, I could tell. Um, and also it just being a newer exercise of trying to really 
get a handle on like the parts and how they're operating and separating that voice from my my voice. Yeah. Yeah. Given that this was your first shot at it, you're really good at it. Mm. Yeah. I mean, we went to an exile mm. that many people takes months to get to. Yeah. So. Well, we'll see. I mean, what is the, uh, what is the, what's the, tail look like on this in terms of, you know, how many sessions you have to do or how do you have to, like, what is the, you know, kind of protocol to maintain yeah, so those maintenance, breakthroughs? Maintenance simply means what I was saying earlier, like tomorrow morning, wake up, see how this 15 year old's doing, if he's still feeling good. If not, why not? What happened? Did some other part throw him back? Um, because it was threatened to not have the power over him. Uh, and, and so just maintaining it on your own now, mm -hmm. uh, it helps to map it out in some form, uh, but take it as, you know, as real. Right. This is a real right. inner system that needs maintenance. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Um, before we before we close it all down though, um, I think it would be cool if there was some kind of, like, is it okay to give the audience some type of practice? I mean, you talked about what the thing that you do in the morning, but is there some kind of takeaway uh, that they could start to wrap their heads around and, and do themselves? Well, the closest I can think of to that is I did a series of these kind of things, exercises, meditations mm -hmm. for Sounds True. Um, and I forget what it's called, but they should be able to find it. All right, we'll, we'll find it and link it up in the show notes. Yeah, and there are, in the book, No, no Bad Parts, mm -hmm. I think in that book too, there are also exercises. Yeah. Yeah. All right, good. Um, any place other than those two places and, and picking up your books, particularly the latest one that you wanna direct people towards? Uh, there's another book that just came out last month called an introduction to internal family mm. systems, oddly enough. And- uh, That feels like that should have been the first book. Yeah, well, <laughs> these are actually second editions of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so all of that's coming out through Sounds True. And uh, yeah, otherwise, if people go to the website, which you can post, there's a bunch of other stuff. Mm -hmm. Cool, well, I, I really appreciate the work that you do. Um, I know that it's been transformational for for many people, including you know people that I'm close to, and uh, and uh, I was moved by what you just took me through. So I appreciate that as well. I was honored to, that yeah. you trusted me enough to do it, honestly, and really happy we could do that big yeah. piece. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Cheers. You too. Peace. <laughs> Peace out.